yeah, I suppose you hear me without a micro. It's okay. I just have to turn around to see all of you, but <laughs> you hear me at least. So I'm Eloise Petit indeed. So I'm a professor at the CNAM, which is a continuous training, like a university, but for continuous training. And also a researcher at the CEET, which is the Centre de l'Etude, de l'Emploi et du Travail, which is a multidisciplinary center doing research, where people do research on employment, uh, basically. So <clears throat> this is where I'm going to talk to you from. And my co-author here is John Forth. So he's not here, of course, uh, because he's in, in London. And well, <coughs> I'm still going to present common work with him. So the paper is entitled Internal Labour Markets in Britain and France. And I'll start by saying... Sort of, sort of. Well, uh, just a second. The data is before Brexit, but the reflection is also oh. after Brexit. So hopefully results hold for most of them. So let's say a word about uh, our motivation. So, well, the first motivation is, well, as I said, I'm a labor economics professor, so working with empirical studies on labor since a long time already. And the first point is that whatever you're looking at, you would find some duality, okay? Uh, obviously, you would find heterogeneity, like if you look at wages, uh, contract, uh, training, uh, pay policy, whatever dimension of labor you're looking at, well, you will see heterogeneity, of course, but you will see also a cumulative effect of this heterogeneity, meaning they will build up in some duality. Okay, it's not totally heterogeneous. And especially in the case of France, <coughs> we would see that some firms would accumulate all the good aspects. Okay, it would be the same firms that would have higher wages, longer contract, uh, promotion opportunities, training opportunities, and whatever type of uh, opportunity you could have as a worker, they would be in the same firms. And on the other hand, firms where you would have bad wage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, would be the same firms. So the point is, these characteristics would accumulate at both ends in the labor market, okay? And once you find that in one country, okay, well, you kind of think it's tautological, okay? Uh, well, you're, when you're healthy, you're rich, and it goes together, and <laughs> you often find the two together, and it sounds tautological. What was interesting here in doing this comparison is that we could open the box and see to what extent it was not only tautological, but specific, okay? Because in fact, it is not only tautological. The, all these good characteristics don't have to go together, okay? In some firms, they would spread in some other countries, in some other models, they would spread at different firms. And there is some specificity about the French case in being very cumulative in some firms. What I've put here is that it's also cumulative on the worker dimensions, okay? These good characteristics, saying good in terms of uh, wealthiness, basically, well, they would also accumulate in some workers who would be the one qualified, stable, with access to training, et cetera, et cetera, with good wages, et cetera. And these are also cumulative to some worker profiles as opposed to others who would accumulate bad characteristics, okay? And so it is this basic, I would say, uh, um, fact that we wanted to put into perspective. Uh, wh what perspective? Is that of labor market segmentation theory? <coughs> so I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, and I'm sure not, of you, not all of you are familiar. So uh, I'll just put it here a little reminder. Oh, I'm sure you already heard of the concept of internal labor market, okay? This is like a very badly chosen term because it has the word market in it, but it especially is defined to say we're outside the market. The specificity of internal labor market is that 
they are outside the market. They are not ruled by the market rules. Okay, and so when they introduced this concept, Doringer and Puri in 1971, it was exactly to say that actually, for some people, price and job allocation were not ruled by the market, as we would think. Okay, labor economics would uh, classically say, okay, price, price, uh, the price of um, um, the price of uh, labor wage and labor allocation is ruled by the market. Well, they would say no. In some firms, this is ruled by internal rules, by firms rule, by administrative rules. And at some point, this was revolutionary in 1971 to put things in this way and kind of stayed, and the term is coined now and very much used to represent this idea of, well, labor management being decided inside the frontier of the firm, okay? So, to some extent, this points to the idea that for some workers, for some firms, not for all, the rules and, and allocation of work and jobs is done on uh, referring to internal rules and not market rules, okay? Well, it would be basically the idea in, well, you, you would have to imagine big firms, okay? And the idea that the wage you would get in these big firms maybe is loosely connected to the wage you would get with your qualification in some other firm, okay? But it's mostly connected to when did you get in this firm and what has been your past and your career in this firm, okay? So internal rules would be more important than market rules. Okay, in saying which is the job you're going to have, which is your propensity to change job inside, and which is the uh, wage level you're going to have. Okay, so wage and job allocation would be mostly ruled by internal rules, okay, internal to these firms. <coughs> so the point is, they obviously defined that in 1971, meaning in reference to a type of employment system that was very different from today, okay? Their concept is coined uh, after having do, done field work in the region of Massachusetts, in industries, in manufacturing in the late 1960s, okay? So all the concept and the study of these concepts from the 1970s and 1980s is basically referring to this setting which is, of course, very specific and not so common today. Okay, so there has been a lot of work, and I'll come back to that, saying this concept is no more useful because the type of career path, the type of uh, labor management that was spotted at that time is not uh, accurate today, so we shouldn't refer to this concept anymore. What we are raising here as a hypothesis is that maybe the fact that we still see a lot of duality, at least in some labor market as the French one, maybe this points to internal labor market still existing. Okay? So this is the starting motivation. We're saying, okay, we all agree that we're not into um, General Motors 1960s model of employment anymore. But then, should we not refer to the concept of internal labor market overall, or is there still an accuracy for this concept, even if there's no accuracy for the old employment system? Okay, so, well, we have a French expression, which is, should we throw the baby with the bath water? Something like that. So, basically, should we throw the concept with the changing practices? Okay, so this is the question we're raising here. Um, so, as I said, starting motivation is on French results, on for results for the French uh, labor market. But it was very important to get this comparative literature. Why? First, for the reason I told just earlier, if you're looking only at one country, well, part of the results look very tautological, like very natural. Like, okay, it's always the same people who have w uh, good jobs, uh, well, good wages and stable jobs, okay? Sounds tautological, but having it in a comparative way shows it's not always the case. So it's very important to be comparative here to step 
one, one step backward from what we're seeing and seeing what's specific in what we're seeing. So this is a general argument about comparative analysis. But there's also a second point, which is that, um, well, in the segmentation literature, there's a long tradition in comparative analysis. And basically, as I said, the earlier works were from 1970s by Doringer and Puri, and very quick, it had some success in France, and people would show that the exact same way of applying the concept would be accurate in France. And from the late 1970s already, we have results about showing how ILM were, do exist in the French labor market. Okay? But at the same time, getting the concept to other countries, well, yields people to adapt it, change it. And notably, in the British case. And in the British case, where well, this is pre-Thatcher, not pre-Brexit, but pre-Thatcher Britain, so very different from today, there was OLM, Occupational Labour Markets, <coughs> meaning there was a, an employment system typical of the British labour market in the 1970s that was about mobility from firms and career building going from one firm to another in the same sector was really an important thing. And it was like co-managed or at least had a very important um, place for unions in building that, okay? So this type of occupational labor market, we're really symbolic of 1970s British labor market. So this is just to remind you the idea that Having a comparative analysis also helps to bring alive concepts and see how they apply differently in one country to another. So here, our question was also to use again this comparison to see if the concept is still accurate in each country and how they would compare today. Okay? And also, basically, because it's good to have ideas, but if we don't have anything to test them on, uh, well, we can discuss for a long time, but uh, the, obviously another important motivation was that we had a data set that was very comparable for the two countries, and that basically enabled us to embody the question I just raised and compare the two countries very nicely in terms of HR practices and consequences for workers. I'll say, of course, a bit more on that. <coughs> <coughs> so, um, the presentation outline is classically, I'll say, a word on the context and research questions, so a bit longer than what I just did now, just the theoretical context. And then I'll go into really our original results in terms of data and method, and, well, the definition we adopted for the ILM indicator, because as I said, we're not going back to the way they were defined in the 1970s. We're saying they changed. So now we need a concept that enables this change, this dynamic version of ILMs. And then once we spotted who we're going to call ILM, we, of course, go on to do their portrait in terms of human resource management strategies, and then in terms of which firms are concerned. And finally, the discussion point, we'll, we'll try to build on these results to see what we can um, conclude from that. So the, in terms of literature and context, uh, well, as I said, well, this is kind of a, a, a little a synthesis of what I just said earlier. From the 1970s emergence of the concept of ILM until the 1990s, basically, it was very common to understand the labor market in terms of labor market segmentation, and especially with the concept of IL internal labor market, ILMs, that were used for France, as in the US, and for the British case, it was the concept of occupational labor market that was used, and also for Germany. So, with Thatcher basically breaking the union system in, in the UK, the occupation and labor market went down quite quickly in the 1980s. But it stayed a bit longer in Germany, and there are still papers developing about how it is still working in Germany, notably with all the apprenticeship system, 
Okay? And it's, it is a representation of the rule of, for apprenticeship system where you have at this sectoral level the building of qualification and the building of careers from one firm to the other, not internal to a firm, but to an occupation, basically. Okay? So you, you are trained into an occupation and then your career is built going from one firm to the other. But we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the internal labor market. I'll say that. Well, at the turn of the year 2000, here are some key uh, papers I quoted that basically pointed to the fact that ILM, as we knew them before, were declining. Okay? And basically, they would point on the role for seniority as a governing criterion that was less and less used. <coughs> and the role for internal stability that was less and less used in the US and in France, also Gauthier's paper is for France. So these kind of pointed at the decline of the ILMs in the way they were defined in the 1970s. And for most people, this went with the decline of the concept of ILM itself. Okay? What we propose here is basically to come back to the concept because we propose to change the concept and have it in a dynamic definition of ILMs and not a static one strictly referring to what, what the practices from the 1970s. Okay? What we're proposing is not to say that the job, um, the way job is managed is the same as in the 1970s. But we're saying, again, we're not going to throw the baby with the bath water. We're going to keep the concept even we, if we're letting go the way it was embodied in the 1970s. Okay? So, the question, the, the false question here is, was this the end of segmentation theory story? And, well, we propose to answer no. <coughs> we actually ha argue that um, getting rid of the ILM concept is the consequence of a persistent reference to the old way ILM was embodied. Okay? If we refer to, let's say, General Motors in the 1960s, of course, this way of managing employment does not exist anymore. But if you refer to the concept of managing employment in a way separate from the market, this still will exist. And this is what we're going to argue here. So we argue for a step aside, a step away from the way ILM were described in the 1970s to show actually the current relevance of segmentation theory. So we want to go back to a more conceptual definition of ILMs. This is what we propose here. Basically, the idea is that internal labor market, well, are units that would offer more than market conditions. Offering market conditions would be a strict reference to market. Okay? The idea that some firms, indeed, would decide what wage to pay, looking at what is usual to pay for this type of workers. Okay? And would decide what contract to pay, uh, is a reference to what is usual to offer as a contract for these workers. Meaning some firms would actually strictly, or not strictly, but mainly refer to market conditions in defining their employment strategy. <coughs> but others, our point is that others do have internal reference and do concretely, uh, in fact, offer more than market conditions to their workers. Okay? And they do have their internal decision and they have their decisions that are internally settled and, well, pretty much separate from, well, not totally separate, but with a, a long, um, uh, a foreign reference to market conditions. And more precisely, we do argue that some firms offer career opportunities. So the, the way we use a dynamic like intertemporal concept is using the terms of career opportunity. We're not saying it's careers as in the 1970s. Okay? It's not you know, all, all about this image 
of careers in the 1970s that you would come in and know exactly what was going to be your progression for the next 10 years or so. Now, of course, the idea is not so rigid, but still, some firms will give you career opportunities and others won't. Okay? And the point is, we think it is still very useful to distinguish the two. So what we're going to call ILM are <coughs> those firms that offer career opportunity in terms of secure employment and wage progression. The point is, a firm that would offer that, well, it would offer you the condition for a career, but this career can be internal or external. Okay? You can use the resources the firm gives you in terms of training, in terms of managing opportunity, in terms of getting to new businesses, etc. But then you can use that, but also use it as a stepping stone to go in another firm. Okay? So the idea is you would have the two options. You would have internal labor market, let's say the old way, with internal career, internal to a firm, but also career path that would go from one firm to another. Okay? And this actually was already pointed by Puri in the 1970s. This was already true in the 1960s and 1970s. The top management wouldn't do their whole career in the same place. They would actually do it from one firm to another. And <coughs> so we're still here in line with the uh, original concept. The second point here is, well, why is it important to uh, keep on with this concept or not? Well, it is mainly important for this reason, for segmentation that is um, uh, stemming from the existence of ILMs. The segmentation theory is not only about internal labor market. It's about the segmentation of the labor market that comes from that. And this is the second point, which is actually very important and which is, that to me, <coughs> which is actually what makes segmentation theory a theory and not only a description of some practices. Okay? Why is it specific? Well, basically, because the point, the underlying point about studying these ILMs is that these employers' policy, these ILMs, the, these policies and prices, well, they are the driving force in structuring the labor market. They are the one making the segmentation in the labor market. It is a side effect, of course. Firms don't do it to segmentate the labor market. But the side effect of their policy, the indirect consequence of their policy, is that they actually create segmentation in the labor market. Why? Well, because basically they offer some conditions, some specific conditions to part of the workers. They don't offer it to any workers. Okay? They offer it to some of the workers. And then, well, they, there is some barrier for other workers to access these internal labor markets. So in the end, you would have a segment in the labor market constituted by the firms that offer internal labor market and the workers that have access to it. Okay? And so this would be a, a specific layer, if you want, in the labor market, separate from the rest and not accessible for the rest of the workers. And this makes it a very crucial point in terms of public policy. Because if you want to improve the conditions of uh, working people, well, you have to act on this barrier. You have to enable them to access the, f the primary segment, or you have to open this primary segment, or you have to develop this segment into a larger uh, share of the labor market. But this is what becomes crucial. Okay? If you're not in line with this type of representation, well, the usual employment policy, what is their argument? Well, the usual policy is train the workers. Okay? It's always on the workers. Is train the workers, 
make them accept new jobs. And you have, I mean, even the re most recent reform, uh, I don't know if you heard of it in the French labor market. <coughs> the most recent reform is about imposing to an unemployed that he would accept uh, uh, open-ended job. And if he doesn't accept the second one, he would just get out of, of uh, an employment system. Okay, so it's always on the worker that the policy tend to act with the idea basically that he can get access to a good job if he's willing to, if he's trained to, and if the conditions in terms of, uh, let's say, um, uh, mobility, childcare, it, the idea is if we offer the good conditions for the workers in terms of mobility, uh, training, childcare, they would get access to good jobs. If you are having a segmentation literature representation or a segmentation approach of the labor market, you can see that this is not the only point. You also need to act on the employer side and not only on the employee side and not only on the unemployed. You also need to have an active policy on the employer side and help them or impose them to offer better job conditions. Okay, so this is where it becomes a very important and uh, structuring in its representation of the labor market. It's, that it's because it turns your attention to the firms as the driving force in the labor market. Okay, the idea that you can do whatever you want as policies, as a very active policies on the workers. If you're not acting on the employer side, well, you will miss something. You can't change the whole picture, okay? So there's no symmetry between employers and employees. And this is an important point. And then employment policies should focus on employer first. So this, um, well, yeah, another point is about which firms do put in place ILMs. The idea here is not basically that some firms are, or some employers are nicer than others and the nice ones develop ILM and the bad ones just give bad working conditions. Of course, it's more complicated than that. And so, well, my point is then it's very important to understand which firms are in the appropriate context to create ILMs because what you want to do in terms of public policy is develop this type of context, okay? Is, well, help the firms who don't have economic, the, the adequate economic context, help them to develop it, okay? And give them the resources to develop ILMs. So it's very important to understand which firms are able and willing to implement ILM strategies. <coughs> Um, okay, so I talked about the primary segment, so the idea that these ILM workers and ILM firms are the one constituting what we call the primary segment, and it's not easily accessible for all workers, and especially for those in the secondary segment. So in this... Um, in this exception of internal labor market, I would argue, and of course with others, not the only one, that the concept of internal labor market and labor market segmentation does stay accurate and does stay very important as a way to understand the functioning of the labor market. And so an important precondition in designing uh, employment policies. So in this paper, this was like kind of a side presentation of segmentation, but coming back to the paper, in this paper, well, we focus on internal labor market, meaning we focus on firms that do give career opportunities inside the firms, okay? Not only career opportunities from uh, external mobility, but from internal mobility inside firms. So we focus on these. So the point is, can we still find some of these in France and in Britain? 
And well, what is their prevalence and where do they exist and what are the contours and drivers of these? What we bring to this debate is, of course, well, this presentation about this dynamic representation of the concept of ILM, but also, as I said a bit earlier, the richness of the data we were able to mobilize here, so which I'll present them a bit later on, uh, but our comparative linked employer-employee data. And also, we bring to the debate a comparative view for the two countries, and you'll see it's important. So let's go about our results and data and methods to the second section here. So, well, the first point, I'll present the data and the way we define ILMs empirically. So the data for France, it's a survey called Réponse, and uh, for, Brit for Britain, it's a survey called WHERES. Actually, what is very nice with these two surveys is that the French survey was built with an eye on the British one. It was some kind of copied as an example on the British one, and they would replicate it on the French uh, situation. So <coughs> this means that the philosophy of the two surveys and the type of questions that are developed are really close. They're not strictly equivalent, but they're really close. And we were able to build equivalence into a large set of questions. Okay, these two surveys, they were historically made, well, to look at uh, employment relations at firm level and also collective voice uh, relations. And well, they were first developed in the 1980s in, in the UK. For France, the first one is 1993. And well, they had common waves, so they were run approximately at the same time in 2004 and 2011. So we would have these two large set surveys approximately at the same date for the two countries for 2004 and 2011. Unfortunately, since then, it's been stopped in the UK. So the, the French actually did continue to run this survey and the French Ministry of Labour ran it again in 2017 and just last year in 2023. But for Britain, the last one is 2011. So we have to stick to this one for the comparative part. Um, so it's a linked employer-employee data survey, meaning for each establishment, we have a 80-page questionnaire to employer and then a six page questionnaires to a set of workers. Okay, so we have this cross double view on, on the firm and we have a lot of questions, as I said, on union, collective voice, collective bargaining, but also on the economic setting of the firm, on corporate governance, on, well, uh, and on HR practices the firms actually puts in place. So we have really a wide range survey, which is really nice. Uh, uh, here's a link to the website where we did actually a very, um, uh, with John Forth, but also Alex Bryson and Thomas Mosse. The four of us did a lot of work into having this comparable data set and we, we built a pooled data set with the two countries and also a set of uh, translation of questionnaires and well, a full set of, um, of table pointing which question were comparable. So the link is here so that you can use this uh, comparable data set if, you, if you're willing to. And of course, uh, to share the work we've done on that. <coughs> so the scope of the two surveys, of course, we have to have the uh, common scope. The British survey also has public sector, but not France one. So we uh, focused on the private sector and we had to focus on establishment with 11 or more employees. Okay, so we don't have the very smallest firms, but we still have a large share of firms. And on the employee set, because I said it's a linked employer employee, and for the employee data set, you have to bear in mind that we have employees with at least one year tenure. This is by construction mainly because 
There's a questionnaire for the employer, and then questionnaire are sent to the workers, and the data set, well, the list of workers is taken from a one year before uh, list, so basically they're all at least one year uh, tenure. We have at least one year tenure. The survey in the end has two th nearly 3,000 establishments for France and 1,000 for Britain. So this <coughs> will lead us, well, obviously we have much less establishment for Britain because their sample was a bit different because it was built to have also the public sector, but we're not using it. And we have approximately the same number of worker uh, questionnaire. So more than 10,000 in each country. So our empirical definition of ILM, the, our basic point was we wanted to spot at firms that had high wages and high tenure. So the point here is we want these two, we point, well, we, we suggest that these two characteristics, if they go together, they will be a good hint at firms getting a career opportunity, okay? Because you can be very stable, but that won't be enough because you could have very stable job, but very badly paid. And we don't want to consider these type of jobs as ILMs, okay? It, we consider it's not having career opportunity to be paid minimum wage the whole your life. You're just staying here because you'd have no other opportunity, basically. And so high tenure is enough and high wage is not enough in the sense that, as I said, we want to spot at ILMs that enable internal careers and not careers from one firm to the other. So we want people that have high wage but stay in the same firm. So really we want these two characteristics to go together. So here is, well, our empirical method is two-step. The first step is, well, we want to spot firms that pay high wage and firms that, pay, that have high tenure, okay? And the second step is we're gonna cross these two information. So the first step is really to spot out firms that pay high wage, uh, wages and firms that um, offer high tenure to their workers. How do we do that? Well, we have a tenure and a wage equation. And basically, we correlate these. So we, we take the employee questionnaires, so the 10,000 sample of employees, and we look at their tenure, correcting for or controlling for gender, age, and education. So basically, the information they come with to the firm, all the rest of the information is built in the firm but age, education, and gender, they come in the firm with these information. And so we control for these three dimensions and <coughs> we estimate here the gamma G is an establishment fixed effect. Okay, so we kind of estimate uh, what is the expected tenure for this individual E in firm G and then see how it, it, the effective tenure departs from this uh, estimated tenure in a specific way at the establishment level. Yeah. With tenure, you mean how long a person? Yeah. Okay, so tenure for an individual would be uh, an individual E in firm G. So it's the time the, the person would spend in that firm. So the idea is the time you would spend in that firm, the, the tenure you would have in that firm would depend on gender, age, and education. But how it departs from that, well, may be specific to that firm, okay? So the fixed effect will estimate how specific this te act actual tenure will depart from expected tenure given gender, age, and education. And so we have a, an average estimation. Estimating it this way, we'd end up estimating for each firm gamma G, which would be the average departure from expected tenure at an establishment level, okay? So for each establishment, we would see how workers in that establishment depart from what would be expected for their tenure, okay? 
And we do in the same logic for uh, wages. We see how actual wage levels, controlling for gender, age, education and tenure, how these actual wages at a firm level do depart from what would be expected. Okay, and this would be the uh, wage fixed effect for an establishment. So from these two estimation, we have um, a tenure fixed effect at the establishment level and a wage fixed effect at the establishment level. The next step is then to cross the two information. Oops. Oh yeah, here I had a little, some data on the distribution of wage, but I'm not sure I'll go there, or maybe come back if you want, but just go directly to step two, which is basically what we do with these fixed effects. Well, we have this blue sample, which would be workplaces with high uh, wage fixed effect and the yellow, uh, red uh, bubble. <coughs> with establishment with high tenure fixed effect. So basically, once we estimated fixed effect for all establishment in a pooled sample for Britain and France, we actually split this sample into those are over median and under median. Okay, so high is over median here. <coughs> so the point is, we have some firms that are spotted as paying high wages and some others, that, uh, another group that are spotted as having high tenure. And the thing is, we will define as ILM those firms who actually accumulate the two characteristics. Okay, exactly in line with uh, what I said in the introduction, the idea is we want here to spot at firms that accumulate good characteristics so we want to spot at firms who actually offer high wage, but also high tenure to their workers. Okay, And here is a point where if we would be only in the French case, we would find that this uh, is superposed to some point and we would find it as normal. But when we compare it to the British case, we can see whether two characteristics are much less cumulative in the British case than in the French case, okay? Meaning that these two uh, bubbles, if you take it only for the British case, they would be uh, disconnected for a large part of it, while in France, they'll be more connected, okay? So comparing the two countries, you can really see the difference and see how this cumulative effect is acting differently in, in the two countries. And you can find that in these numbers that for Britain or for Britain, the share that is here connecting the two characteristics is only 60% of workplaces, while in France, it will be 38%. Yeah. In case that in, in <coughs> there exists occupational labor markets, this test would not be enough to catch them, right? Yeah, here we can only spot at internal labor markets, yeah. So the point is, yeah, it's not tautological to have the two because it doesn't exist in the same way everywhere, okay? And basically, if you look at the correlation between the two characteristics, it's much more important in the French case than in the British case, okay? So this cumulative effect that I would see in French statistics appears to be quite specific to the French case, at least in regard to the British one, okay? <coughs> and this is what comes out here with the fact that those firms accumulating high tenure and high wage are much more common in France than in Britain. But you could also see it another way around and say, okay, but they do exist in Britain. It's not totally out of the picture, okay? 15% is not a 2% or 5% negligible situation. It still appears to exist to a, a non, um, not so, um, I'm not sure negligible exists in English, yeah? <laughs> so not, not so small share of the labor market, let's say. So now that we spotted and 
Oh, yeah. Now that we spotted who are INMs and the way we define them, we're going to look at, uh, well, basically who works there and what are their policies and what are their characteristics in terms of uh, uh, labor market um, or HR strategy. So first, which individuals are in ILMs? So the bad news here, it, this slide could pretty much go strictly in the same way as for the 1970s. So it's still uh, more male, more middle-aged, more higher education workers and in occupations with higher skills. Okay, so here again, <coughs> we're in the usual profile of those that are in the best situation in the labor market. And basically those will, which, who can be spotted as having the highest uh, bargaining power in the labor market. And this nicely refers to, well, nicely or not nicely because it didn't change over the time, but it quite directly refers to a literature in the 1980s who already spotted that the duality in firms would connect to a duality in labor force. And you would have some firms offering the good conditions and you would have some workers that would have access to these conditions. Okay, And this would be specific. It wouldn't be random. So. These double connections of double segmentation, let's say, segmentation of labor demand and segmentation of labor supply, still appears to be uh, quite important. So now if we look inside this ILM and to the HRM practice or the HR policies the firms actually put in place, the first point that is important, I think, is that these ILM, <coughs> they have high tenure by definition, okay? We define them to have high, high tenure workers. But what is important is this high tenure is not obtained because they dismiss less workers than the others. It's obtained because the workers quit less frequently. Okay, so the driving force here is not the change in employers' dismissal policy. The driving force is actually the people want to stay, okay, and they quit less often. If we look at the empirics about the dynamic inside this labor market, if you look at voluntary quits per 100 workers, they are much less frequent in ILM firms. But if we look at dismissals or redundancies, they are as frequent in ILM firms and in others. Okay? So the driving force about stability is workers wanting to stay. Okay? So that the f I'll explain how this table goes in, in a second. But the first result I want to point is this one, meaning that high tenure is firstly due to less frequent quits and not less dismissals. So in terms of HR logic, the point is, how is this achieved? What do the employers do that makes people want to say? Okay, because basically this is how it goes. <coughs> so how HRM tools are mobilized to encourage worker stability. So we'll see there's a whole set of different incentives that can be pointed based on career opportunities, pay level or employment practices. And the point is, we're here having a descriptive analysis of what's going on in these ILMs. Okay, we run some, um, um, some, some um, econometric equation to see which characteristics which were more discriminant. But this is not what we want to have as a general logic. Our general logic is really into what are the characteristics of these HR policies, okay? Not what is the most discriminant one, but what are they overall? Mm -hmm. So we, we don't run uh, an econometric analysis for all the workplace strategies, but we go one by one and look how they are developed and in th and this is the table we're using here. <coughs> so we take each practice separately 
okay, and compare how frequent it is in ILMs, how this frequency is different in non-ILM firms, so what is the difference with non-ILM firms, and we test if this difference is significant. Okay, so these are basically results from uh, all different analysis. Okay, for each uh, point taken separately. So here you can see then for Britain and therefore France. So a voluntary quits per hundred employees is a mean of six point three in Britain, in I in British ILMs, which is five point six less than for non ILM British firms. And this difference is significant at three stars, meaning more than 1%. Okay? So you can see this difference is significant and negative for Britain and for France. So sometimes the measures are strictly comparable, they're on the same line. Sometimes they are loosely comparable, so they're on different lines. Okay? This is why for some point you don't have directly comparable points. So let's look at these other lines. Well, the first type of incentives, well, yeah. <coughs> well, the first type of incentives we're looking at here are incentives through career opportunities. The idea is, okay, maybe firms give career opportunities that make people want to stay. Remember, here we're trying to understand why people want to stay in these firms. Okay, so the first point is, maybe they want to stay because they have career opportunities. And we had a set of questions that could help. Let's look at the French case here. We had a question to workers about employee has been, in, in, your, in your workplace, the employee has been, uh, no, have you been, sorry, promoted in the last three years? And then you see people saying yes to that question are much more frequent uh, in ILM firms. Okay, so the fact of having been promoted is much more frequent when you're working in island type firms. And the fact that you express that, that the likelihood that you will have a promotion or pay rise in the next 12 months is also more important. So we take these as hints that there are career opportunities for these workers in French ILMs. Okay? We have an only an indirect equivalent for the British case, and I'll point at it because it also points out an important uh, statistical fact. Um, well, the question here is to employers and saying, are vacancies filled internally pr uh, pr by preference? Okay? And then, well, they would say yes in 42.1% of ILM workplace, which is 11.2 more than in non-ILM workplace. But still, this difference, it's not significant. You see, it's nearly significant because the p-value is at 13%. But then, one of the reasons for that is, if you remember, the, the British sam sample is only a thousand firms. And this is a firm level question. Okay, so the statistical power of the results for Britain are often much weaker because of the size of the sample. So I'm just saying that uh, for this point. So it's kind of still going a bit in the same line, even if it's not significant. That's the point I'm making. So in terms of career opportunities, you would say that, especially for France, there are more career internal promotion uh, uh, opportunities given in ILM firms and the last line would show that you have more opportunities to have full-time contract and permanent contract if you're in an ILM. <coughs> <coughs> now looking at opportunities incentives based on pay levels uh, I'm trying to think in terms of uh, Time, maybe I won't go through each of the table of results and you already had the paper. And uh, maybe just main point at uh, main results that come out from them. Well, you have the tables in the paper, of course. So what we see in terms of payment systems, well, we see that French firms, and this is specific for France, we have more profit sharing schemes, share ownership plans, 
and bonus schemes and merit pay. So a lot of collective structure uh, tools to um, associate the worker's remuneration to the firm's results or to the group's results, okay? Economic results. So very incentive-led uh, remuneration scheme, much more than in Britain. These are actually much less developed in Britain overall, and they don't appear as specific in British ILMs. So this is a point that is different in the two countries. Now, if we go uh, looking at employment relation and voice, well, here we think one point that is common to the two countries is in ILM firms, you have more union membership and more on-site representatives. But then, in the French case, you also have more bargaining. Okay, but once again, this has to be interpreted in the context that bargaining is much less frequent in the British labour market overall, okay, than in France. But still here, you, you can start seeing some differences in HR practices in French and British uh, ILMs. <coughs> if I still go on focusing more directly on the results and not the tables, uh, in terms of skill development, this is common to the two countries. We see a lot of uh, a very um, clear-cut uh, st ILM standing out as firms where you are more often trained on the job and off the job, okay? Both in Britain and France, and especially for France for on the job. And in terms of work organization, well, this is specific for France, where you have more often teamwork, autonomous production teams, and problem-solving groups, and actually, if we look at the French situation, we see this type of uh, work organization actually are connected to the collective payment systems we just saw before. They really go along one another. So overall, here's some kind of synthetic slide about the characteristics of ILMs in the two countries. In both countries, they offer more stable, more full-time jobs. They have payment schemes more favorable to stable workers. Sorry, I didn't point at these results, but it's basically the fact that you still have tenure pay, meaning your payment is connected to tenure more intensely in ILM than elsewhere, and especially for more than 10 years tenure, so very long tenures, okay? So people, person who stay more than 10 years in a firm do have their payment that rewards actually this tenure. So even if tenure and seniority pay is less present than 40 years ago, it stays an important characteristic. This is what is pointed here. Uh, another common point is collective uh, voice and, and union voice even if there's less bargaining in the British case. And another common point is access to continuous training, so to um, improvement of your qualification. And on top of that, French ILM stand out as having more internal promotion, more on the job training, and incentive-based um, collective remuneration tools. So more specific. The last section is about which firms are concerned. And so here, the first, again, the first part of the results are really close to what we could see 40 years ago, meaning we're talking about large firms. Well, obviously, the ones enabling internal promotion are obviously larger than others. If you're in a 10 people firms, firm, you won't have a lot of opportunity to move inside, of course, but then still important to have it in mind. And it's also old firms, okay? They are on average more frequently more than 20 years old firms. And they are more frequently in some sectors. Well, the underlying ones are specific for fonts. So we find manufacturing, okay? This is totally in line with what appeared before. But what we find also is some sectors we, or some <coughs> industries we maybe wouldn't have thought of like construction, finance, 
and other business services. Okay, so high qualified services business basically. And they are typically offering the conditions for uh, this type of ILM career. And they are especially absent from other sectors. Now, what is the competitive setting these ILM firms are in? Okay, here is the point also that may be important in terms of public policy, meaning we could see <coughs> that the HR practices are quite favorable in terms of public policy. You would want more workers to have access to these type of firms, okay? So if you want to think of it this way, well, you have to think of, okay, in which sector they are and what resources, what economic resources they have that we would want to deploy for other firms. Well, this is where it becomes a bit complicated because they are operating often in national or international markets, so they're very uh, big, wide, wide markets. <coughs> and if we look at the French ILMs, their market share is frequently not dominant. But once you're in a worldwide market, this is obviously often the case. Again, another important point is the volume of business is stable or decreasing often. And let's go down to the point here. They have a competitive strategy based on innovation, originality, quality rather than price. Okay, so qualitative uh, basically strategy. And still, their financial performance is above average, but it's not significant. So the thing is here, we have some kind of mixed economic situation. It's not a stable, growing, favorable, uh, booming situation. Okay, it's rather stable, actually, but it's uh, rather building on a whole long-term history of uh, staying on the market and having this yep, strategy. Does stagnation, does stagnation uh, detail does not apply to the British Islands? I'll come back to the, the British. Uh, it's, it's quite close because it's mature or declining, but the, the wording of the question is a bit different. So this is why we have the results separately put. But the point is, well, a bit in the same way, and it's even worse. <coughs> Sorry. It's even worse in the British case because they appear not to be leader in their market, which is kind of the same thing as not dominant or can be close to that. But the point is they're not leader in, in developing new product services or techniques, meaning they don't they don't have they don't seem to build on an economic strategy in terms of their market. Well, on the first side, you can see that they have a competitive strategy based on innovation that could use the resource and the HR resources they have inside. Here in the British case, it appears not clear um, what is, how they um, valorize, how, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the internal resources they are building on. They're not really building, it looks like their competitive strategy is not built on this HR resources they're uh, nurturing inside, really, pretty much. So this is the part where it's a bit puzzling in terms of public policy. And notably because there's always, I don't know if you read a bit about the good job debate in the US, but there has been all these debates since 20 years about where are all the good job gone, jobs gone, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and it's the whole story about uh, inequality growing and the share of good job being smaller and smaller. And there's some kind of a puzzle for people, uh, well, labor economics mostly, asking about where have they gone and how could we develop them again? And one point in this debate, there's one underlying point that trying really with a political sense uh, uh, of uh, politically oriented research that and notably Osterman, Paul Osterman's article that would point at, okay, you should develop good jobs and it really addresses to firms saying you should develop good jobs. This would give you good market conditions and this good will give you good economic uh, results. What we're saying here is the equivalence is not, <laughs> 
is not so easy between the two. Okay? We're not saying these firms have difficulties in, in terms of competitive strategy, but when we're seeing it's, get, it's difficult to transform or <coughs> It's not as if they would have this big comparative advantage and be so easily uh, dominant in the market with all these HR resources they're nurturing. We're seeing it's basically more as a continuous combat to stay at this level. And they're basically, well, maintaining stable, and that's all. Okay, not much more. And they're not having much more than, in, in both countries, the financial performance is above average but not significantly in a statistical point. And it's above average as, well, this is a point that is not really well measured in the Réponse and Weber survey. So we could dig in this question and, and surely merits it should be developed because it's really an important point in terms of policy debate and policy recommendation, okay? This is not the best selling argument to say to firms, okay, develop these type of strategies. And the problem is, the usual debate is, okay, go on, invest in your HR, and then it will have a nice consequence in terms of your strategy. Okay, what we're seeing here is not so easy, the, the, the um, connection between the two. And basically, we would need to know more about that and about the, how they connect and how they can fuel the competitive strategy, how the HR investment can fuel this competitive strategy. So now this leads me to the concluding point. Well, there are basically different level of conclusions that can be made. The first one would be, if I go back to the theoretical development, the idea that, well, ILM profile is still accurate in a theoretical point, meaning there are still some firms that offer the conditions for internal careers. This is not only history, this is not only your grandparents, there is a clear probability that yourselves, you will have internal careers, okay? And <coughs> so it's still important to look at those and to have those in mind in terms of policy recommendation and policy building. And because when we ha adopt this segmentationist point of view, well, the good news is they still exist. The bad news is there are barriers to entry zones and they're not accessible to all workers. And we could see that the worker profile that was inside is very specific. And so if we want to get those more open, open to other workers, then there needs to be a real uh, reflection and construction of a policy in this sense. Well, then another point is, yeah, well, they still exist. What is their profile? they're pretty much quite close to the classic profile of uh, building, of having training, full-time contracts, union-mediated voice, interns training. So part of the story can be told in a way quite similar or quite close to what was said in the 1970s, actually. <coughs> Even though others are different, and especially in the French case, in terms notably of work organization and payment systems that are really different than what we would describe earlier. So maybe we could interpret this difference in terms of national specificities, meaning British case also, the British situation also leaves way to ILMs, but to a lesser extent, and maybe to a lesser extent also in, in um, to a lesser extent quantitatively, but also qualitatively, maybe, okay? Because they don't have all the same tools that are developed inside. Um, well, these are some results about the stability of these ILMs, is basically estimating, taking separately the two countries to have a longitudinal analysis and take advantage of the fact that for France, we have 2017. <coughs> we kind of wanted to see, okay, what happened after? We have a 2011 story and how stable is that? What we could see basically if for Britain, we could see it's relatively stable. Well, the share of ILM is relatively stable if we look at 2004 and 2011, we can't go further. And for France, 
we, could, we can go further to 2017, and we could see then that it's relatively stable, but decreasing, okay? Which also points to an important uh, aspect in terms of public policy, which is not taking these ILMs for granted. We also, I mean, there is a need to really understand their capacity to survive and to develop and to offer good conditions to more workers. So in the end, uh, maybe a more open way to put the question is, should we favor uh, these type of uh, employment conditions? Meaning, well, maybe this is not the only option in terms of uh, uh, developing uh, career opportunities. And maybe uh, <coughs> it's still also an open question to ask for where are, are there other firms that would be specialized in, or not specialized, but that would offer career opportunities stepping from one firm to the others? And maybe these are more booming and we want to favor these other ones, okay? We, we may need the full picture uh, before deciding which one we want to support. And then I'll finish on that. Oh no, <laughs> sorry, there's the last slide about, uh, well, the research extension that could go from that. Yeah, well, there are actually three research extension uh, already developed or more future. The first one is already developed. It's really, again, with uh, Thomas Mosse, Alex Bryce, and John Forth. We really wanted to have, well, use this um, powerful data set, and we actually coordinated a book which looked at comparative analysis of French and British HR practices and employment situation in very various different dimensions. And our point is that, well, you, I'm sure you know about varieties of capitalism literature, which is basically macro literature, okay? And somehow uh, resumes national situation to macro situations. What we're saying in this book is how Having internal diversity, the degree of internal diversity is part of these macro pictures and should be part of this macro picture. It should be considered as an internal feature. And notably, the fact that the British labor market is much more heterogeneous in its very numerous dimension is part of the feature of the macro model of the British economy. So that's the first point, like about adding this dimension to the macro representation of models. The second point, uh, well, it's uh, an important but difficult point. It's, well, actually having some empirical um, elements about these barriers that segmentation are supposed to build in the labor market, meaning uh, looking more precisely about the pathways and mobility of workers that are inside these ILMs. Where do they come from and where do they go after that? And to what extent, to empirically, uh, can we say that our P P there is a barrier to entry these type of labor markets for some workers? For now, it's only indirect evidence that we have. <coughs> And the last open question is, as I said a bit earlier, uh, we would want to look for inter-firm uh, career path and where do they go to what firms are, uh, from, for what firm are they typical? And well, how did they develop and who they point at? Now it's the last slide. Thank you.